In 2019, Blake Leeper, double below Nate Amputee and eight-time Paralympian, was ranked the sixth fastest man in the world. Just a year later, he qualified for the Tokyo Olympic Games, only to be disqualified. But why? Lipa and his attorney are claiming a racist, ableist rule is to blame. He appealed the ruling, but in October, he lost the appeal. However, he's taken further legal action in the higher courts and he's still hoping to compete in the delayed Tokyo Olympics later this year. In this video, I'll be giving you all you need to know to understand this case and make your own minds up about whether Lipa should be allowed to compete against able-bodied athletes in the Olympics. Pistorius. Now, I'm not going to gloss over the fact that he's a convicted murderer. He shot and killed his partner in 2015, I think it was. However, that's not the point of this video and he did break down a lot of doors in terms of disability sports and he was the first amputee to run in the Olympic Games against able-bodied people. Similar to Lipa, Pistorius has always dreamed of running in the able-bodied Olympic Games. But in March in 2007, the IAAF implemented a rule which includes a ban on the use of any technical device that incorporates springs, wheels or any other element that provides a user with an advantage over another athlete not using such device. The IAAF stated that the amendment was not specifically aimed at Pistorius, although he was the only person attempting to get into the Olympics at the time. To decide whether he was running with an unfair advantage, the IAAF monitored his track performances using high-definition cameras to film his races against able-bodied runners. In 2007, Pistorius was invited to undergo a series of scientific tests at the German Sports University in Cologne. Under the guidance of Professor of Biomechanics Dr Peter Brueggemann in conjunction with Elio Locatelli who was responsible for all technical issues in the IAAF. After a few days of tests, Brueggemann reported his findings on behalf of the IAAF. The report claimed that Pistorius's limbs used 25% less energy than runners with complete natural legs running at the same speed. Brueggemann said Pistorius has considerable advantages over athletes without prosthetic limbs who were tested by us. Based on the findings on the 14th of January 2008, the IAAF ruled Pistorius's prosthesis ineligible for use in competitions conducted under the IAAF rules, including the summer 2008 Olympic Games. Pistorius called the decision premature and highly subjective and pledged to continue to fight for his dream. His manager, Pete Van Zylem, said his appeal would be based on advice from experts in the United States who had said that report did not take enough variables into consideration. Pistorius then underwent a series of tests at Rice University's Locomotion Laboratory to be able to compete against able-bodied athletes. In the Rice study, they concluded that Pistorius used 17% less energy while sprinting at full speed and expended identical energy to able-bodied runners overall. University of Colorado's Elena Grabowski, who we'll talk about later, she now directly works with LIPA, determined there was insufficient evidence to prove Pistorius's carbon fibre flex for cheetah prosthesis gave him an advantage. From Grabowski's study, the CAS, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, unanimously decided to backtrack on their decision to disallow Pistorius in the Olympics. They said the report did not consider the disadvantages that Pistorius suffers at the start and acceleration phases of the race, and that overall there was no evidence that he had any net advantage over non-disabled athletes. Pistorius didn't end up qualifying for any individual event in the 2008 Olympics, but the IAAF took issue with him qualifying for the 400m relay, recommending to the South African Olympic Committee that they not select Pistorius because of issues of safety. I understand why they were wary about this, but there seems to be many different adaptations they could have offered before just recommending to not include him in the race. In the end, Pistorius didn't qualify for any group event in 2008, but in 2011, he did qualify for the relay in the able-bodied World Athletics Championships in Daegu, South Korea. There, he was selected for the heat, but he was told he had to be placed in the first leg of the relay because of issues of safety. 
Their reasoning was that in the first leg, the runners are still mainly in lanes, so there's less risk of collision and therefore injury. But as we discussed already, athletes running with prosthetics are slower to start out of the blocks and therefore will be much better placed in any other leg where the athletes have a running start. This meant that although South Africa qualified for the finals, they decided to remove him from the team and he didn't make it to the finals. However, in the finals, South Africa came second, so he got his first silver medal in an able-bodied competition and became the first amputee to win a non-disabled world track medal. The IAAF later rescinded their point of him having to run the first leg and said he's allowed to run anywhere in a relay, so in the 2012 Olympics, he ran the fourth leg. However, the South African relay team placed seventh in the final only beating Cuba, who did not finish. All of this really is to describe how the IAAF has treated people who have tried to get into the Olympics before. It seems that there's a a kind of fear, there's there's a resistance there, which may go some way to explain how Lipa is being treated. Pistorius didn't win the 200 metres in the Paralympics either. Brazil's Alan Fontelles, Cardoso, Oliveira pipped into the finish line by 0.7 seconds in the T44 200 metre final and instead of congratulating his worthy opponent he launched into a tirade. He said, we're not running a fair race here, I can't compete with Alan Stride. He went on to say that he was powerless because his rival's blades were longer by 4 inches giving him a longer stride and therefore the gold medal. This was Pistorius' first ever 200 metre loss. The outburst was uncharacteristic of the athlete and it led to the world taking note and NBC News reported his remarks as reverberating through the sporting world. The complaint was supported by single leg runners including Jerome Singleton and Jack Swift who called for the T43 double blade and T44 single blade class to be separated in future events as single blade runners were unable to adjust the height of their prostheses and must always match the length of their biological leg with a running blade. There's kind of an assumption there that the taller the blade, the faster the runner will go. A day after his loss, Pistorius apologised for the timing of his comments but said he does believe there is an issue here and I welcome the opportunity to discuss it with the IPC. The thing that was ironic in this case was Pistorius's stride length was actually longer than Allen's in this case. So his stride length was actually 9% longer. It was 2.2 metres whereas Oliveira's stride length was 2 metres. I I think this is really funny because it just shows what a perception can mean for the rest of the sport. He's saying that you won because your stride length was longer, but Pistorius, your stride length was longer and you still lost. There's so many of these misconceptions that end up having wider consequences. And I think it's it's really sad to, to base things on assumptions when evidence needs to be found first. Following Pistorius' eruption, the IPC commissioned a study into amputees' maximum allowable standing height, ultimately leading to the reduction in maximum allowable standing height for many athletes, which we'll discuss later. So finally, we get to Blake Leeper. So Blake Leeper was born in Kingsport, Tennessee, with both of his legs missing below the knee. He was born with a congenital condition called fibula hemamelia, and he wore prosthetics from the age of nine months old. There's a lovely picture of him sitting next to all of his prosthetics that he's had over the years. He started playing sports from a young age as well. In 2008, Blake Leeper said he remembers seeing Oscar Pistorius on TV and thinking, if he can do it, I can do it. Pistorius' success really drove him forward. Looking for guidance in this area, Pistorius decided to message all of the Paralympic team in the US on MySpace. (laughs) A response from Paralympian Ryan Fan resulted in him getting his own pair of running blades. He made a lot of strides in those first few weeks and he actually won his first race. Within three years, he matched Pistorius' record for the 400 metres. Lipa made his international debut in 2009 at Rio de Janeiro. In 2011, he won a silver medal in the World Championships 100 metre relay with a time of 42.84 seconds. 
In the 2012 Paralympic Games, he won his first individual silver medal in the 400m T44 event and a bronze medal in the 200m T44 event with a time of 22.46 seconds. In February, the US Anti-Doping Agency decided to test a sample of Leaper's blood that they collected in 2015 after the Nationals. They announced that Leaper had tested positive not for cocaine but for a substance cocaine metabolizes into. Cocaine is of course one of the substances prohibited by the United States Anti-Doping Agency. It's also prohibited under the International Paralympic Committee Anti-Doping Code. Leaper's use of cocaine was recreational and that was evidenced by the fact that there was only the metabolic substances in the blood. That among other mitigating circumstances meant that he was eligible for a reduced sanction of just one year. In interviews since, Blake admitted that this is where he hit rock bottom. He admitted that he was addicted to drugs and alcohol and he enrolled in an AA programme. He's now sober. However, the consequences of those actions meant that he couldn't compete in the 2016 Paralympics. Blake Leeper returned to athletics in the US Track and Field Championships in 2017, becoming the first double leg amputee to compete at the event. After qualifying for semi-finals with a time of 45.52 seconds in the 400 metres, Lipa was able to break Pistorius' world record with a time of 45.25 seconds. In 2019, Lipa beat records again, running a time of 44.3 seconds. That's the sixth fastest time any person on earth has ever run a 400 metres. This qualified them for the 2020 Olympics. However, this is where we pick up the story again, as the World Athletics Committee has disqualified him from the race, on the grounds that his prosthetics make him too tall. Here is the part of the rules that is the crux of the issue. It says, A competitor's artificial limb must not create the unrealistic enhancement of stride length. This is called the MASH rule, which stands for Maximum Allowable Standing Height. In 2008, the algorithm to determine an athlete's mash was changed, which meant that the allowable standing height for all athletes reduced significantly. After these came into effect, athletes lost on average 8 centimetres. The evidence for this was based on a paper written in 2015 that stated the existing MASH guidelines were over generous. As a result of the change, World Athletics planned to actually wipe everyone's world records and start again. Even athletes who had a standing height below the maximum their records would also be wiped. I'm not actually seeing any evidence of this happening yet. I'm not really sure if they're going to implement it, if they change their mind, or maybe they're waiting for the 2021 Olympics to um, refresh the numbers. I'm not sure, but that's what they plan to do anyway. Apart from this being completely demoralising, what are the real world effects of this change? First of all, it takes a long time to train on new blades, so Leaper may not have time to get up to his original numbers in these shorter prosthetics. It's quite disruptive and some people have even injured themselves trying to retrain on these new blades. Also, it's really expensive, so new blades can cost thousands of pounds and some people just don't have that money. It's kind of become a barrier to entry for the new season of athletics. Why is this also a race issue? So it turns out that the data that they used in the 2015 study, which informed this new change, was collected from just white and Asian athletes. Black athletes seem to be a excluded from the study. Blake Leeper and his lawyer argue that if black athletes aren't included in the study then they can't apply the rule to him. Leeper and his lawyer argue that black athletes have different proportions to white and Asian athletes and although I don't know if that's true, either do the researchers. By excluding black people from the study They've, they've essentially created an algorithm that is exclusionary to black athletes. For me, I just think, why were they not included? Why was this oversight allowed to happen? And it's not just in sport research, it happens in all research, medical research, scientific research, it happens everywhere. And it's just not good enough. 
diversity in all studies is really important because different demographics of people may react differently to certain drugs. There may be different proportions, as Blake Lever and his lawyer have stated, and there may be cultural implications for why a demographic does or doesn't take to a medication or a process as well. A recent article by the AJMC stated, for many years, assessment devices like the Breast Cancer Research Assessment Tool was only validated for white women, which significantly underestimated the risk of breast cancer in black women, who actually have higher rates of breast cancer at younger ages. By utilising data derived from a primarily white study group, scientists ignore the impact of cancer drug efficacy on the other three major race groups, which may prove detrimental to survival rates. Lead study author Jonathan Larry, MD, provides an instance in which a medication used to treat lung cancer showed mediocre trial results in the general population, but exhibited incredible responses with non-smoking young Asian women in a study in Asia due to a genetic mutation common in this population. This could be a whole video on its own, but it does prove the point that diversity in research is really important and there are some differences between races that could account for a height difference, it could account for susceptibility to certain diseases and it could change the efficacy of certain drugs. The issue of racism, although completely valid, may not be the reason that Lipa ends up actually being able to run in the Olympic Games and that's height. There's a new study that states the height of the prosthetics actually makes no difference in terms of the speed of the runner. Elena Grabowski, who I mentioned before, designed a study to find out does height make a difference in the speed of the runner wearing the prosthetic. She said, we found that height makes no difference when it comes to maximum speed. These athletes are having to buy new configurations and go through a lot of hardship and expense for a rule that is not based in science. For the study, Grabowski and her co-authors recruited five elite sprinters with double below the knee amputations for a series of running trials on a treadmill. The runner sampled three different brands of blades and five different combinations of stiffness and height within each brand for a total of 15 different tests. In each test, they were asked to start to jog and push themselves to the maximum speed possible. Some achieve speeds as fast as 10.8 meters per second. Just for context, Bolt's top speed was actually 12.27 meters per second. During this, the researchers measured how the runner's biomechanics and pace change with each blade configuration. Someone who works in Grabowski's lab says, biomechanically, the idea makes sense. Longer legs equals longer steps. So you would think you would be able to run faster. But we found that while you do take longer steps, you cycle your legs slower. So in the end, the two even out. The authors acknowledge their sample size is small. Only five athletes were able to contribute to this research, but the pool of people to take the research from is really small. They see the need to do a larger study. For now, they just hope that the International Paralympic Committee will take note of this research and reconsider their new MASH regulations. What do I think about Blake Leeper? I think he, he should be allowed to compete against able-bodied athletes in the Paralympics, but I think a lot of the time, world athletics are kind of happy for disabled people to stay in the Paralympics and not venture out into the Olympic Games. And they seem to see it as evidence enough if you're succeeding in a certain area that you've got an unfair advantage and if they seem to then try and find out why you've got an unfair advantage and why you're winning. The problem with these studies, especially the 2015 study, was that it was set up to prove a point, to prove that these athletes had an advantage because of their height, because of comments that Oscar Pistorius had made. However, does that mean that he, he should compete just because he can compete? Some people argue that because there's different muscles involved and different actions involved in running with blades compared to running with biological legs that they shouldn't be competing in the same category they shouldn't be competing together they kind of see it as comparing someone cycling with their legs and arm cyclists and um, they believe they shouldn't be put together i'd say it's kind of more like comparing the fosbury flop to the scissor kick for example these are two different methods that can just be used to 
to get the same outcome. You're converting chemical energy that's stored in the body into kinetic energy, into movement to propel your body from one place to another. Ultimately, it comes down to what the point of the Olympics is in the first place. Is it to show who's the best, the fastest, the strongest without aids, without technical aids? In which case, would you have had Bolt run without his shoes? His shoes had spikes in the front to allow him to grip the pavement better, to get him to a faster speed. And there are other technologies that are within a boot that allow him to be propelled forward more quickly. There's a reason that Olympic records continue to get broken year on year and I do think that's advances in technology, whether that is in a booth, whether that is in the swimwear. A lot of swimwear has like a shark skin texture, which means that you can glide more quickly through the water. And also there's there's additional technology in terms of training. So there's like cryo chambers, which help you recover faster. There's controlled oxygen training and all kinds of wearable hydration trackers, all different trackers to, to make your body the healthiest body that it is. These are all technological aids that without, we may not have already got to the point where we are today. We're bolt around 100 metres in 9.61 seconds. If you do think, okay, well, it's silly to go barefoot, it's silly to go without this technology, then what is the purpose of the Olympics? Is the purpose of the Olympics then to celebrate hard work, endurance, resilience, mental resilience? Is the Olympics to celebrate these feats of human endeavour? In which case, Lipa should definitely be able to compete against able-bodied athletes in the Olympics. There's no doubt in my mind that he has worked as hard, if not harder, than his able-bodied counterparts. And he's overcome obstacles that they may never understand. So, what do you think? Do you think he should be able to compete against able-bodied athletes? Do you think Pistorius should have been able to compete when he did? I'd love to know your thoughts. All the references for this video are linked on my info page, which is below this video. I'd love it if you could subscribe and please let me know what you want me to talk about next. Bye! Bye.